Oh, go ahead and take a seat. It's so good to be a child of God, isn't it? Oh, we have an amazing, amazing, good, good father who loves us, who loves us very, very much. Uh, and we get to be his children uh, with all the, the rights of a child of God. But you know what I love about being a child? Other than the, the annoying bets that children make about how long they can grow their hair. Um, <laughs> Other than that, I love the, the fact that the children have this unending capacity to play games, right? Some of you are like, well, it's not great that it's unending. But we, we, we play games, right? All of us probably have, have played games. We, we, we talked about that. Uh, I want to dive right in. Let's, let's see what we thought about the games that we loved playing um, when we were kids. Here it is. Look at that. Look at that. All you 38% who chose that, you're my best friend. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, who just does not like Monopoly? Anybody? A couple of you, a couple of you. Oh, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, this thing is so, it's genius, isn't it? Like, I, I used to, with my sister, uh, she's six years younger than me, she used to challenge me uh, to games of Monopoly, right? And so we'd break this thing out, and like three hours later, we're, we've barely dug into it, right? Right? And like it's time for dinner. And so, like, okay, we're getting out TV trays because this is on the dining room table and we're going to eat in front of the TV because mom and dad are patient enough to let us come back to the game afterwards. And then still, it's bedtime and we get to leave it out because we got to come back. Anybody have these massive Monopoly marathons like this? A couple of you? Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. I beat her every single time. It's great. It's great. Until she finally beat me once. And now that one victory means more than all the victories that I had against her, right? Right? She will not let me live it down, that I get uh, lost to her in Monopoly. Well, uh, I've loved playing games, right? Uh, but my game playing has evolved over the years. I've gotten a little bit older, I've gotten a little bit smarter, and a little bit nerdier, okay? Uh, so, with uh, some friends of mine, I, I play these uh, DC deck building games. Uh, you can see right here, you might have never heard of a, of a deck building game. Um, don't worry about it, uh, it's what nerds do, okay? Uh, and, and we build a, a deck, and, and you play as a, a character, as a, as a hero. You can see here, I've got uh, the Flash. You, you start off, and you, you take on the characteristics of the character. Uh, there's all different kinds, especially uh, with all the different you know, uh, superheroes that are out there. Uh, and they give you an ability. Like So the Flash, uh, whenever the, the game provides a card that tells you to, to draw a card, you then get to draw an additional card, right? So you, you, you want to lean into that ability uh, to do that, and that's going to help you succeed in the game. Um, we love this game, me and uh, my roommates, uh, so much that we started keeping uh, track on a scoreboard. Um, and I had a picture um, that I was going to show you of the scoreboard, but I'm too embarrassed now because I am losing terribly, terribly losing. So... We are talking about Jesus at the movies. What does this have to do with a game? Well, bear with me for just a second. Uh, if, you, if you missed last week, uh, Ralph uh, shared about the idea that, that the gospel, it, it breaks out in 10,000 places, right? Uh, it, it cannot be held back. You can find it everywhere, all over culture, and that stories which represent culture there may be no bigger medium by which we understand culture, by which we, we tell stories than the movies that we watch, than the movies that um, flood the box office and drive us uh, to the theater. And so uh, Ralph unpacked a little bit of Infinity War, which has made just shy of $2 billion at the box office as the fourth highest grossing movie of all time. Well, today we're going to talk about another movie, uh, and it is Jumanji. Anybody here seen the original Jumanji movie? Okay, who here has seen this sequel? Okay, a, a few of us. So uh, Jumanji, if you're unfamiliar with it, uh, it's a story that came out uh, back when I was a kid, a story of, of a young boy, Alan Parrish, who discovers a board game, and the board game uh, sucks him literally into the world of the game. And the, the friend that he's playing with gets freaked out, right? Uh, and so he goes missing, and it's all these years later, and a brother and sister, uh, they find the game, and they start playing, and all of a sudden crazy things start happening, right? Like the, the things that the game is talking about all of a sudden starts to take place in, in real life, right? Where all of a sudden there's you know baboons everywhere, and there's a lion 
in the bedroom and, and all the stuff that the game is bringing into to life. And eventually it brings this young boy, Alan Parrish, played by Robin Williams, back. And the two of them, uh, Alan and his childhood friend, then have to complete the game in order to survive, in order to finish it and set everything back to normal. Well, in the sequel, uh, the, this board game is left on a video game console, uh, and it transforms itself, because it's magical, into a video game. Let me share with you uh, a little bit, if you haven't seen it, what this is about. So, uh, you've got uh, four characters, uh, Spencer. Uh, now, Spencer um, is, is a little bit of a nerd, okay? He doesn't take risks. Um, in fact, he had, he had this childhood friend, but then they kind of grow apart, and the friend kind of uses him to do his homework for him. Uh, and so, uh, but that's like the, the most dangerous thing that Spencer is willing to do. This friend, his name is Fridge, uh, and Fridge, just, he, he's a football player, and he just kind of uses people, okay? He doesn't really see other people. He just uses them for his own selfish game. Gain. And then you have uh, Bethany, uh, who is you know the, the, the pretty girl who's self-absorbed, doesn't care about anybody else, she's too pretty for anything, uh, only cares about herself and not anybody else. And then you have Martha, and, and Martha is like too smart for everybody else, okay? Uh, and she lets people know it. And, and, and all these things kind of coalesce into them getting detention, okay? So they go to detention, and uh, they're, they're cleaning out a, a storage space that's going to get converted into a computer lab, uh, and they discover this video game console. And they start playing it, and they choose uh, different uh, characters that they get to play as, and before you know it, they're sucked literally into the game. And, and it, the movie takes us into the world of Jumanji, and Spencer um, chooses the character of uh, Smolder Bravestone, Dr. Smolder Bravestone, played by Dwayne Johnson. Um, just look for the largest man on the screen, that's Dwayne Johnson. Uh, Fridge um, chooses to be the you know, zoology expert, um, Mouse, um, which is interesting because Fridge is this normal uh, large guy, but then uh, he's called Mouse in the game because of his diminutive stature. Uh, he's played by Kevin Hart. Bethany chooses uh, the professor Shelley Oberon um, and doesn't realize that it's actually a male character uh, that, that the game is representing. And so then she is uh, playing as a man in the game, as Shelley Oberon, uh, who's played by Jack Black. Okay. And then finally, you've got Martha, uh, who uh, selects the, the character, the avatar of Ruby Roundhouse, killer of men. Uh, and, and she uh, is uh, played in the, the game, in the movie, by Karen uh, Gillen, um, who, if you've seen Infinity War, it plays Nebula uh, in the Marvel movies. Okay? Uh, and so they're sucked into this world. And... They've got to figure out how they're going to survive, how they're going to complete the challenge of the game. And they discover that they're given incredible skills. And so they, they've got to use these skills in order to progress in the game. They've got to lean into, into these skills. Uh, Smolder Bravestone uh, realizes that he can throw a boomerang, that he has strength, that he has speed, um, that he has smoldering intensity uh, that just makes everybody else pause and, and look at him. Discovers that he has no weaknesses in the game. They're playing as a video game. Their, their characters get special skills. Well, Fridge discovers uh, that he knows zoology, so he knows uh, animals, and uh, he is uh, the carrier, basically, of... Smolder's bag of weapons, okay? So basically, he just accompanies Smolder Bravestone everywhere and just has the weapons that Smolder uses uh, and discovers that his weaknesses are strength, speed, and cake, which he's not too fond of, of that. His weakness is strength. Well, uh, Bethany, played by uh, Jack Black, uh, Professor Shelley Oberon, uh, discovers that uh, he, she, uh, understands uh, cartography, which is the study of maps, paleontology, the study of fossils, and, and, and some other things. And then finally, uh, Ruby Roundhouse discovers that she can do um, karate and tai chi and dance fighting. Um, it's like, dance fighting, is that even a thing? Yes, yes some of you. Some of you have, have done that. Wow, I'm, I'm impressed. I am, I am very, very impressed. Uh, and that her weakness is, is venom. And so they, they, they learn this about themselves and they, they set off uh, to go and play in this game and try to conquer what the game is asking them to do. 
So they go off uh, into the game, and they've got to discover uh, a jewel, find a jewel, uh, in order to return it to uh, a jaguar's head, uh, so to speak. There's a guy that's going against them, um, and... Uh, they're racing kind of against him in order to uh, complete the challenge of, of the game. Uh, along the way, they discover, right, that they, they're doing incredible things, things that they had never been able to do before, things that are they're not uh, innate to themselves, right? Um, Spencer, who doesn't ever do anything dangerous, right, like, like writing somebody else's paper for him is the most dangerous thing that he's ever done, and it almost gives him, like, an attack, a heart attack, right? Uh, well, I mean, in, in the game, because of, of, of the role that he's playing, at one point, they're riding in a helicopter, and the helicopter, um, something malfunctioned, and so he climbs out on the side of the helicopter to, to fix what's wrong with the helicopter. Like, he, he's, he's beginning to, to, to do some incredible things, um, Character of Mouse um, learns how to defang a snake. Uh, Ruby Roundhouse takes out uh, just a plethora of enemies that are going up uh, against her. They learn how to do these incredible things. And the question that I am curious about is what if we could do incredible things? What if we could, could discover something incredible inside of us that we could lean into? On the other side. That we could lean into to, to live this life, this adventure that God has called us into. But what if we could do incredible things? What if there was a power inside of us? Maybe something that we haven't known was there that's going to help us succeed in this life. It's going to help us live into what Jesus has called us into. How amazing would that be? How would that transform our lives? How would that transform your life? To start living into these skills, these, these abilities that come with playing this game, living out this adventure. Just, just think for a minute. What could that look like? Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Don't cry. Oh, so many diseases out here. It's hot. Okay, this is what I'm good at. Playing video games. It's what I do. It's literally the main thing that I do. Play a game like this, there's gonna be levels. In order to finish the game, you gotta complete the levels. Spencer, do you even know where we're going? Kinda. Kinda? Oh, that's good then. We're in good hands. Okay, the missing piece, I'm guessing. The problem is, there's nothing here. What do you mean there's nothing there? It's a map, just like you said. It's a map of Jumanji. Cartography. What's that? The study of maps. It was one of Professor Oberon's skills. Yes, that's right. Oh, so you can't see this, but I can. not So there's got to be a way to access our... Oh! What you just do? Strength. Fearless. Climbing. Speed. Boomerang. Smoldering intensity. What just happened? Um, you just smoldered. Weakness. None? Strength. Karate. Tai Chi. Aikido. Dance fighting. Dance fighting? Is it even a thing? Weakness. Venom. Paleontology. What does that even mean? Um, study of fossils, I think. I hate this game. <laughs> what if we could learn those skills? Jesus uh, said this in John chapter 14, 11 through 12. It says, believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Not about you, but, but when, I, when I read that, it, it kind of begs the question of, 
well, what works are you referencing? Okay, so, so believe uh, on the evidence of the works themselves. He, so he invites us to examine that, right? Look at my life, see what I've been doing, uh, and believe. We can believe, we can trust that Jesus is who he says he is because of the incredible things that he did. Right When he walked on water, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, when he fed 5,000 people with a small fish, all of these things which are verifiable eyewitness accounts that these things actually happened, we can know that we can place our trust in who Jesus is because of the miraculous, incredible things that he did. But then he says, you'll do the works that I have been doing. Okay, so believe based on, on the miraculous things that I've done, but if you take a look at my life and you believe in me, you're going to start to do the things that I have been doing. And I don't believe this is exclusive just to the miraculous things. I think this includes the everyday things that Jesus did. When he used grace and truth in his approach with the woman caught in adultery, the way that he would spend quality time with God in prayer all night, how he trained his followers, the way that he spent time with the marginalized, the poor, the forgotten, how he was present in suffering, how he reached out to people and, and met their needs. You're going to do the things that I have been doing, he tells us. So if, if we're gonna if we're gonna do the things that, that he's been doing, the, the things that he's he's called us to, the things that he said, look at my life and do this, then we need to study his life, don't we? We need to observe, we need to 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 watch him, to imitate him. Uh, we use a, a word to describe this, it's called disciple, right? We want to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, for a lot of people um, in the church, we understand that word. A lot of people outside the church, they don't understand that word. That word can come up with a lot of baggage. I want to maybe give you a, a new word picture to help us understand the idea of really studying Jesus and doing the things that he uh, did in his life and doing that in our own. I like the term of being an understudy, okay? We're talking about movies, okay? We're talking about uh, the, kind of the, the theatrical, right? The, the, the main leading part, right? They, they, they have the role, they do it. And the understudy, right? They're off to the side in the background and they're observing, okay? They're, they're following, they're memorizing the lines, they're doing all of that. And, and they're, they want to capture everything that the other person is bringing to life of that character. I think this is maybe a picture that we need to grab onto of what it means to, to be a disciple of Jesus, to do the things that he has been doing. See, those who immediately followed him, who were his understudy, who, who were his apprentices, who were his disciples, they changed the world, didn't they? Twelve men. And a whole bunch of women who followed him, they changed the world. In these last several years, though, our our world, our, our culture, it's been changing radically, hasn't it? People have, have not liked the job that we've done as the understudy, right? They say, hey, I've, I've read about Jesus, and I kind of like what I see, but I, wanna, I look at you, I don't like that. Ralph talked a couple weeks ago about the idea that hypocrisy, the, the way that we can't live up to, to what Jesus called us to, is one of the biggest reasons for people not believing in Jesus, for not being part of the church. And our culture, our world, seems to keep getting worse, doesn't it? We have racism rampant in our world. We have the, the Me Too movement, where our world, where our culture has treated women with disgust. We have violence, school shootings. We have suicides. It's like we've been tossed into a dangerous world full of threats that want to just overwhelm us. The characters in our movie, they were tossed into a dangerous world. One where they could lose their life at any point. 
Jesus knows that we've been tossed into a dangerous world. And if you actually back up in the, the scripture passage in John 14, he actually tells his followers, don't let your hearts be troubled. Why? Why? Because everything is going bad. Jesus, don't you understand this? Okay, you just, like, one of our friends is about to betray you. Okay, you just told me I'm going to deny you three times. You're going to go to the cross. The world could not possibly get any worse. And yet he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. I think he's telling that to us as well today. Why? Why should we not let our hearts uh, be troubled? I love it. He, he answers that question for the disciples, right? He says, okay, um, there, there's a place where we're going to go. The father, my father has built a house, and I'm going to go there and prepare a place for you, okay? And you're going to be there with me, all right, in this place. There's a, there's a destination. There's a finish line that we can all look to to say, all right, I've arrived. There's hope. This place is safe. It's beautiful. It's heaven. It's paradise. It's everything that I've ever wanted. So he says, okay, we can look to that and have hope. And then he says, you know the way to get there. But I love this. He actually says, okay, you know the way? Well, guess what? I am the way there. You, you know me. You know how to get to that final destination. To be his understudy, to, to, to really follow him and do the things that he's doing, that the process of getting to there matters, okay? It's not just about the end. It's about the way. It's about the journey. It's about the, the process, okay? Let, let me use maybe some more universal terms um, for us here. Um, who here has ever played with Legos? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Um, now, I would get something like this. You know, we got um, Avengers Infinity War, you know, Thanos and Iron Man and whatnot. Uh, I would get something like this, right? I, I couldn't wait uh, to, to play with it, to build it, put it together, right? Um, who here would just, like, dive into this thing after you, you got home from lunch? Okay, a couple of us, okay? How many of you would have when you were younger? A couple more of us, awesome. So, you know the great thing about Legos? It's the building, right? Like, I, I love to have the finished thing, Right? But once I've had the finished thing, I might play with it for a little while, but really it was about putting it together, right? About opening up the, 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 the blueprints for it and, and following the directions and, and putting it together and having, having fun building. It was about the process, not the, the final product. We love the final product, okay? I, I wouldn't do the process if it wasn't for the final product. But really it was the process that made that fun. And I think for us, it's the journey that we go on with Jesus that matters. It's the journey in the game that has the, the biggest impact on the characters. It allows them to discover greater depths of themselves and grow as, as individuals and as friends. We we must invest in this process. We must invest in the way. If we're going to do the things, the works that Jesus has been doing. But then he goes on to say something really interesting. He says, you'll do the works I've been doing. And you'll do even greater things than these. I don't know about you, but I always had trouble with this sentence, right? Okay, Jesus, don't you know what you did? Okay, I'm not about to go and raise a dead person. Okay? I, I can't walk on water. I can't do these incredible things that you're doing, and you're telling me that I'm going to do even greater things than these? What does he mean by greater? Is it greater because there's, there's going to be more of them in the world? Because of, of the movement of people and the church is going to get built and, and the change and impact that we're going to have? Is it greater in kind that you're actually going to do something that is actually literally greater? For me, I like the idea that maybe it actually is that we will do greater things in kind. Because we cannot forget that Jesus redefined what it means to be great. He said, if any of you wants to be great, you must be the least. You must serve. 
he pointed to the humble servant, which was culminated in his act on the cross. The humble servant who lives and loves sacrificially for others. So yeah, Jesus, you, you raised Lazarus. It was amazing. But Lazarus still ended up dying. Could we love someone with the gospel, taking the time and the energy and the effort to serve and love them with the gospel and see them brought from death to life? Jesus walked on water. Could we risk surrendering our pride and admit that we're drowning, sinking in a sea of alcohol, of drugs, of pornography, of addiction to work, of so many things that are threatening to overwhelm us? Could we admit that we have these problems and begin to get help. And I can tell you this, that there are people here who have begun that process and who are already walking on water. And if you're in that place, there is hope for you too to walk on water, to overcome the things that threaten to swallow you up and overwhelm you. Jesus fed 5,000 people with just lunch from Long John Silver's. I've never been able to feed 5,000 people. But maybe I have the time and the resources to meet the needs of others. I can do that personally. I can do that here at this church, right? By participating with the, the benevolence team. By participating in, in giving out Thanksgiving baskets in the fall. By, by joining in with what we're doing at Marcus Whitman where we can meet real needs. It's going to cost us some time. It's going to cost us some energy. It's going to cost us some resources. But the way of, of doing greater things, of self-sacrifice, of, of service, of humility is going to see us do those things. And Jesus, I think, was pointing to those things when he said, you're going to do greater things than these. If you'll be my understudy. If you'll follow me and do the things that I've been doing. We can spend time with the marginalized, the poor, the forgotten, those who don't fit in this world. At school, you got kids, right, who sit alone maybe at lunch, who don't seem like they have a whole lot of friends. What could you do to spend time with them? Do you have a coworker who's the butt of jokes all the time that maybe needs you to, to reach out to them? Do you have that one person that you just can't stand, you find annoying and you loathe when they are in town or when they give you a call or whatnot, what would it look like to spend time with them? Because maybe they're reaching out because nobody ever does spend time with them. What does it look like for our church to be a, a place that isn't just about how many PhDs we have and how, how upper middle class that we are, but who, everybody who walks in these doors is welcome, celebrated, and loved, regardless of their beliefs, background, ethnicity, or life circumstances? What would a church that said, you are welcome here, you belong here, really look like? What does it look like for us to be present with people in suffering? Could, could we start a, a ministry of, of listening, right? That just says, hey, you know what? I don't know if I can do anything, but I'll take the time to listen to you. You know, there, there are businesses actually where, where people um, get hired to go on walks with other people just because they're lonely, because they need a friend to talk to. Would we be willing to, to sit on the curb of somebody's life and just engage with them and listen? Could people know us and know that they don't have to worry about being judged, but that they're just going to experience self-sacrificing love. And in it, they're not going to see, oh, you're just the understudy. They're going to see Jesus. Because we have so captured who he is and what he does and what he's about that the world can't help but go, that's Jesus. And I know I need more 
of Jesus in my life. Incredible things, they're happening here at Westside. If you're just joining us, man, you're, you're in for a ride because there's incredible things that we're beginning to really take, take focus on and, and move in a direction. And, and great things, incredible things are going to continue to happen here at Westside. But sometimes I, I feel like when we, when we sit back and we just wait for the big incredible thing to happen, we miss out on the small things that make the incredible possible. I'm convinced of this, that when we continually say yes to the small things, the incredible will happen. When we keep showing up in somebody's life, when we keep offering grace and second chances and forgiveness, when we keep giving of our time and our our money, our resources, when we continually stop with all the busyness of our lives and actually listen to somebody. There is too much on the line for us to shrink back. The, the adventure, the, the game, the journey that we're on with Jesus needs us to be brave. Okay, so we need a new plan. Yeah. Right. Totally. Spencer, any ideas? Can I speak with you for a minute? Now? What's going on? I can't do this. What are you talking about? I can't do this. Okay, who am I kidding? I'm not some adventurer. I'm not actually brave. Spencer, I just saw you hanging out of a helicopter. It's a lot easier to be brave when you have lives to spare. It's a lot harder when you only have one life. We, we always only have one life, man. Okay, that's, that's all we get. That's how it works. The question is, is how are you going to live it? Which guy are you going to decide to be? We can do this, man. We can do it together. 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 You're a good friend, French. All right. We will do the incredible things when we do them together. We can accomplish that. We can do the incredible things together because Jesus left. The, verse 13 in, 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 in John chapter 14 says, this is going to happen basically because I'm going to the Father. Jesus says, I'm actually going to step away, okay, and I'm going to the Father, but, but all that you're going to do, the, the doing the things that I've been doing, and even greater things than these, this is going to happen because I am going to the Father, because he left. But just because he left doesn't mean that he left us alone. Because he later then tells them, guess what? Okay, I'm going to go to the Father, but the Father is going to send the Spirit. And the Spirit's going to, going to fill you up. See, I, I, I'm learning this lesson that a, a good leader, because of their characteristics, their qualities or whatnot, uh, as they engage with people, um, the un- unfortunate consequence is that they can cast a long shadow. Right? So that when they're, when they're there, everybody always looks to the leader, right? And nobody else will take initiative because, well, the leader always does it. The person that I look to, my, my boss, that person, that A-list personality, right? They're going to take charge, and I can just w- sit back and watch them do it. But I believe the best leaders, they know how to train and then step away. Just say, all right, now it's your turn to do it. Okay? You're never going to stand up on your own if I don't actually get out of the way and let you do this, Okay? We're never going to be the understudy unless Jesus takes a step back and says, all right, now it's your turn to actually get up and do all of this yourself. But we're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit when we do this. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this. This is Paul talking. He tells Timothy, the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. 
Power to stand up to what is wrong in our world. The way that we are together in here and the way that we are together out there should be a beacon of hope, of grace, and truth to a world that is seriously wrong. Personally, as you go about work, as you go about school, as you go about your lives, do you have friends, coworkers, neighbors who've maybe made comments that as you actually stop and think about them, there's some hints, some foundations of racism in them, and that if you let them go, you're not actually helping to stand up for what is right? What would it look like to actually stop and tell somebody, hey, why'd you say that? What would it look like for you to stand up against lewd comments and behavior? To recognize that maybe in yourself, to recognize that in others, and to say, that's not okay. What does it look like for us to just take a stand against violence? The Spirit fills us with the power to do this. We get to be brave. We can love that we will have love to welcome even our enemies around our table. Now, in in our culture today, we don't really use the the term, the words enemies, right? Many of us would say, I have an an enemy. But for us today, maybe maybe the word is, is just those who are different than me. Those who I don't naturally get along with or or look like or sound like or behave like. What would it look like to invite them, those who are different, around our tables? We could invite them to the fellowship events that we're having all summer long here at this church. Who could you bring to one of those? But maybe even more importantly, who could you meet at one of those? Because we could all bring somebody, but if we don't actually then go and actually meet them, what are they experiencing? Could you, who could you invite to your, your table at home? Okay, uh, gathering around the table for a meal is one of the best places to do life together, okay? It's the summer. Have some barbecues and invite some people over, okay? And it's an excuse to barbecue, okay? It's an excuse to get some desserts and some good drinks together and, and bring people, people that you don't know, people who are just acquaintances, your neighbor that you haven't met yet, invite them over. Ralph was talking about the idea that these movies that, that, that we're unpacking, that they are actually avenues into conversations with people because of, of the story of the culture that it represents. Well, guess what? A great place to have those conversations and ask them, hey, did you see this movie? What did you like about that movie? Is around your dinner table. Is in your backyard, okay? Holding a drink and, and grilling on, on the grill. Who could you bring around your table and into your life? Finally, the Spirit gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Self-discipline to keep saying yes to the small things, the small things that make the incredible possible. The small things like, hey, keep doing the dishes, okay? Your spouse is going to appreciate that. Your parents are going to appreciate that. Keep giving compliments, okay? Keep doing the chores you're supposed to do, your homework, your projects, your tasks, okay? Keep taking the time to listen. Keep being a person of truth, okay? Keep not hiding things. Keep not having secrets from others. Keep taking the time to to read God's word. Spending yourself like Jesus did in time alone with the Lord. Keep giving, even when it costs you even when it hurts, even when all you have is one little penny. Keep giving. Keep serving. Even when nobody seems to appreciate it. Keep participating in the life of the church, in the ministries of the church. Serving in children's, in youth, in adult ministries, in prison ministry, in women's ministry, in fellowship, in all these things that are going on. Keep participating. If we, if we are willing to lean into this, we're going to discover that the incredible truth of Jesus' words to us will come to life. We'll do the incredible. All by the power of the God who is on our side. <laughs>